most of the internet is filled with generic financial advice that's not suitable for students. I get it, retirement accounts are awesome, but most students don't have a full-time job and that advice does not apply. This is the video I had when I was a freshman at Stanford University. I'll talk about bank accounts, credit cards, budgeting, campus jobs, how you can save money on books and other things, and much more. So if you wanna be money smart, watch until the end. Also 92% of my viewers are not subscribed to the channel. If you like educational content, you can try subscribing. The most common money mistake students make is not parking their money in the right kind of account. There are many kinds of accounts, but the ones of interest are checkings account, savings account, and a high yielding savings account. Checkings account usually pay interest of around 0.07%. Savings account do a bit better at 0.47%, but a high yielding savings account, like Wealthfront for example, can easily be 5% of interest. Now, I don't wanna to be too carried away. Interest rates are already very high in the US, about 4%. So 5% is although very good in nominal terms, it isn't that great, but still it's way better than the savings account and the checking account. To really visualize how much of a difference keeping your money in a high yielding savings account makes, let's look at the simple chart on Excel. If at the start of college, you park $10,000 in a checkings account, you'll only earn $35 of interest. This is based on the average rate of checkings account interest that we talked about earlier. Savings account does a bit better, you earn around $247 of interest. But at a HISA like Wealthfront, you earn a whopping $2,762 of interest. That's a crazy number compared to the checkings account and the savings account. And this is a mistake that I did myself. I parked my money in a checking account, the money I got from internships and campus jobs, and I got little to no interest on that. I basically lost money over time. Money now is more expensive than money in the future because inflation exists. And I lost hundreds of dollars, potentially thousands of dollars of interest because I did not choose a bank like Wealthfront where I could park my money. Why are high yielding savings accounts cheaper? Because most of these are online bank accounts that do not have the massive costs of a real physical office. And when you park your money there, they offer a high interest rate to be competitive with each other. Now what's the gotcha moment with HISA? Some high yielding savings account do not let you take out money from it at a high frequency. So some accounts will have a restriction, like you can only take money out of it, say three times or five times a month. That doesn't work well for students. But when I got my savings account at Wealthfront, and by the way, they're not sponsoring this video, I ensured that there are no requirements like that. I can take money in and out as I want, and I'll get an interest at the end of the year at the percentage that we already talked about. I also ensure that there are no membership fees, the overdraft fees are non-existent or minimum. And then basically for me, functionally, it works like a checking account. I can take money in and out whenever I want. So you can do your research on it, but I think a high yielding savings account is a much better account than any other kinds of accounts if you need to get your money in and out quickly as a student. Big money mistake the students make is not looking after that credit score. A credit score is a score that you get by using something called a credit card. A credit card is just a way to get a loan from a bank. It's that simple. It's a loan that the bank gives you, and at the end of a period, usually 28 days, it expects you to pay it back. If you don't pay it back in that period, you'll have to give something called an interest every single month. Now, interests can vary according to banks and cards, and it usually also matters whether you are a borrower that's safe, and they determine whether you're safe based on your credit score. A credit score is a score between 300 and 850. The higher the score, the better for you. A high score means you are a safe borrower. You're less likely to default on your loans and a bank feels confident in giving you that money. So you want your credit score to be really high. You might ask, why do I need to take a loan from a bank? Why do I need a high credit score? The thing is, America runs on credit. You wanna get a car loan after graduation? You'll pay a lot of interest if you don't have a high credit score. You wanna get a house loan after graduation? The same story applies. Even if you don't wanna take a loan, say you go to a landlord and you wanna rent a house after your graduation or even when you're a student, the landlord will ask you for your credit score. If your credit score does not exist, they will prefer not to give you that house. They will give it to someone else. So this country runs on credit score and I don't make the rules, I try to play by them. So I'll try to optimize that my credit score is high enough. So the real catch with the credit cards is that the interest rate on it can be really high, usually between 14 and 24%. 14 and 24%, that's a crazy high interest rate. To put that into context, if you park your money in something called an index fund that gives you average returns of the stock market, you usually can get eight to 10% in the long term. 
a credit card company is getting 14 to 24, literally potentially double that amount of money if they loan it out to people and they don't pay on time. It's a very lucrative business and that's why credit card companies are so common. It's a very easy way for them to make money. So does that mean credit cards are predatory? Not really. If you use your credit card like a debit card, you pay the full statement balance at the end of the month, you don't have any outstanding loans at the end of the month, then you're fine because you do not pay any interest. So the TLDR of credit cards is that you should use it responsibly. You should not buy things that you cannot afford and you should always pay the full statement balance at the end of the month to avoid accruing any unnecessary high interest. To show you the difference between a high credit score and a low credit score, let's compare the average interest paid on a $45,000 new car that you can buy after graduation. Your average interest might be 5.8%. And then in the life cycle of the loan, you'll pay about $6,890 in interest. But if your credit score is 200 points lower, your interest rate will be 17.8%. It's a much higher interest rate. And you'll pay a whopping $23 to $45 of interest on the life cycle of the loan. That's four times more interest than you would have paid if your credit score was really high. So the TLDR is you really want a high credit score and you want to lower your interest that you pay eventually if you ever have to take a loan. But credit cards are a great way to earn great perks and cashbacks. If you use a credit card, you get something called points. A point is a virtual reward that people can get. They are redeemable for awesome things. Like you can get subsidized travel, you can buy a lot of things, you can also get discounts on your interest if you have a lot of points. Now, I don't wanna get into the rabbit hole of points hacking. There's literally an entire corner of the internet and YouTube that talks about credit card points, but I really like the idea of cashback cards for students. So you can get a card like Discover that can pay one to 3% of cashback on the amount you spend. This is functionally like a discount on what you spend. I have some cashback cards that just gives me about one to 2% every time I swipe it somewhere. You should also never cancel or close down your first credit card because credit score accounts for how long you have been using credit and that is dependent on the time period of your earliest card. For the first credit card, most people will just use the card at the college's local credit union. While that can be an option, if you do some research before coming to the US or if you're already in the US, if you do some research about which card to get, that can be a great card that you keep for a long period of time. You also usually need a social security number for getting a credit card. Now, if you're American, you already have that. If you're international like me, when you do a job, your employer will give you a social security number. You can get a credit card with that. I think some banks also give you a credit card without an SSN. I'm not sure about that. You should check it, but definitely there are ways to get it fast. Now, one credit card that I personally use and is really awesome is the built credit card because it gets you points on your rent. Now, for the longest time in the US, you could not get any credit card points on your rent. But with the built card, I get points on the rent I had to pay anyway. And that's a great way of earning some perks. Actually, the best way to earn a lot of points is to take offers. So there are often offers like if you get a new credit card, you can get 60,000 points, 80,000 points if you spend X amount of dollars in the first three to six months. These are introductory offers that banks give to lure more customers to them. Now, I'll do a lot more reading on how and what can affect your credit score, but you do not want to be opening way too many credit cards because if you do that, your credit score can take a hit, but it's usually not that much. A rule of thumb is opening one to two credit cards or closing one to two credit cards in, the, in one year is fine, but you should really do more research on that. The easiest way I increased my credit score was to increase my credit utilization ratio. So that's a big word, but what it basically means is how much of your limit do you use as a loan? So if your credit card spend is $100 every month, if your credit limit, i.e. the maximum you can borrow is $1,000, you are using 10% of that limit. But if you call your bank and say, hey, I have this campus job or I have financial aid, can you increase my credit limit to $10,000 a month? And you give a good enough argument for that, suddenly your credit utilization ratio from 10% becomes 1%. And that's literally how I boosted my credit score by quite a few points. And you can also try that. If you're an international student, it's possible that your country has a tax exemption treaty with the US government. Taxation is basically paid by citizens to their country for some benefits. So if you're not a citizen, then it's possible that you do not owe taxes to the US government or not in the same rate. I'm from Bangladesh and we have a tax treaty with the US where in Article 21, we get exemption of any taxes on certain kinds of things up to $8,000. And I use that to reduce my tax burden. So if you're an international student, you should check this out. Also, if you have financial aid in some universities, there's still a tax that's paid to the IRS. But because of the tax treaty, there's a refund and that refund usually comes to you. 
So this can literally be some extra money that comes to you from the IRS because your financial aid already paid for that. And this can be some substantial amount in some universities. It can be anything between $1,000 to $4,000. So that's free money. I think no one's complaining. To build wealth as students, jobs can really help. You can do jobs either on campus that's specifically meant for students or even off campus on a variety of categories. If your goal is just to maximize earning as a student, the best kind of jobs are the jobs that have long hours and low amount of work because then you can just do homework in that period. And the best job for that is a desk job at a library or at a reception. Library jobs can easily be 10 to 20 hours a week and in most cases you just sit there and you can do your homework. Sure, once in a while you'll have to reshelf a book or you'll have to help a customer. You should do all of that. But many a time, no one will come and you can just do homework. I have friends who have 20 hours of work at libraries and they are probably working for two, three hours max. But these kind of jobs are really hard to get. So you should try to get it before the start of a semester. And you should really network and talk to the person who's in charge of these kind of jobs. I recommend the five face rule. That is, you have to show your face five times. And by this, I mean, basically you'll have to send them emails, you'll have to follow up, you'll have to go and meet them in person, maybe once or twice, and maybe even the third time to ensure that they remember to give you the job. Because if it's highly competitive and the job really doesn't require any specialized skills, there are many people who are fighting for this job. And if you want that job, you just have to show that you want it more than others. Some of the awesome jobs for students are like babysitting in the local neighborhood, or running errands for a local family, or tutoring. Tutoring can pay from $20 an hour to much more. I have a friend who earned close to $100 per hour by teaching Olympiad math to kids around his school. I myself earn $90 an hour by teaching debate in China. But these type of jobs are usually hourly, and in the US, they have to relate to your major if you're an international student. In some other countries, it doesn't matter and you can just do any kind of job. Another job that's really awesome, can be really good for the, your school community, is resident assistantship. A resident assistant on an RA basically is a student who acts like a supervisor and a community manager for a dorm. So you organize events, you help people when they need it, you are like a support and a bridge between the university and students. And these jobs can pay really well for things that don't feel like work. For example, at Stanford where I went, RAs get over $11,000 per year. And it's a grant, so it's basically tax-free. At many other colleges, RAs get free food and housing, and you can save a lot of money. And you get paid for creating an awesome community, which is a rewarding job by itself. You expand your network, you help people, and you get paid. And now I think that's a job that everyone should try for. Budgeting as a student is really crucial and can save you a lot of money. Like it's so easy to overspend and you don't really get a lot of habit budgeting your pocket money early on in life. So your college life is a great place to start budgeting. In budgeting, the 50, 30, 20 rule is common. For 50% are spent for mandatory things, 30% is spent on nice to haves, and 20% is spent on savings. But for students, this distribution can vary. Your expenses are really high usually, and your savings might be really low. I recommend listing out three to five categories of your main spending, and then setting a strict budget for that. As a student, eating out or food is a major cost of expense. Food in the US is very expensive in my opinion. My food budget was like $100 a month. I really did not want to spend more money on food. I find buying a $7 Starbucks coffee completely unnecessary. Coffee is coffee and I can get it from my canteen. So if you're intentional about when you want to eat out, it can save you a ton of money. You can also get a to-go container, bring it to your dining hall. And when you have lunch, get food for dinner. A lot of friends of mine did that. And we were all broke students. It was fine and ethical for us. Finally, the magic food that you should eat is bananas. It's cheap, it's nutritious. Instead of eating out, you can do potluck or picnic where everyone brings a dish. I think that's a very nice and communal way of eating something cool and something tasty, but not burn a lot of cash. And there are lots of free events on any college campus. You should go to those free events, network and eat the free food. I usually just bring my AirPods and do work and at the end of the day, enjoy a really nice restaurant catered meal. Tracking your spending can really help you reduce your costs as a student. Budgeting is preventive. It reduces you from spending too much. Tracking is reactive. It helps you respond to overspending or unfair charges that will be on your cards by the myriad of companies with sketchy policies. 
I remember in my first year, I was paying for subscription to a company that I clearly remembered canceling, but they kept charging me for a year. I think eventually I emailed them and got it reverted, but that was very annoying and a cause of massive anxiety at that moment in my life. So you should track your spending, ideally two times a month, to ensure that there are no surprise charges. Once in a while, you'll see a charge that will surprise you. There are lots of free trials in the US. People sign up for those free trials, and even if they cancel it, they just keep on charging. One great website that I use for tracking my expenses was mint.com. Unfortunately, Mint is dying, but all of data from Mint can be exported to Credit Karma, which is also by Intuit. So you can use it to track everything. And it has a really nice interface. Every single expense is by rows and columns. And I can also give categories based on my personal needs. And it shows me by category how much I'm spending on food, how much on automation, how much on other things. Student discounts and subscription hacking can greatly reduce your costs as a student. There are tons of student discounts at various grocery stores, at online platforms, but if you just sign up with your .edu email, you can get a great student discount. You can even ask for student discount. Any subscription that I had for a calendar app for, or any other software subscription, I always got a student discount because I called or emailed the company and said, hey, I'm a student, this is too expensive for me, but I really wanna use your product. Can you give me a discount? And I almost always, I got 20% or more discount right after the email. Subscription hacking means you pool your friends in in one family account, and because you share the same address, which is usually your college dorm or your neighborhood or school or something of that sort, you'll be able to get a family account for cheap. This will greatly reduce the amount of money you pay for a subscription. It's often like 15, 20% of the subscription of a single account. And this can reduce your payments across say Netflix, YouTube Premium, and other kinds of things. Subscriptions are also cheaper abroad. So if there's a way you have a friend who lives in a country like Turkey, India, then you can get them to buy a subscription and be in their family account. It will be way, way cheaper. Like the amount of money it takes to buy a subscription for a month in the US, you can get an entire year of subscription on Netflix or YouTube like that. Also totally an unethical life hack that you should not like must not do is you might be able to change your student email and renew subscriptions. So if your name is like john at x.edu, you might be able to change it to john1 at x.edu and extend your subscription on various things like Amazon Prime and other things. But you should totally not do that. I do not recommend this at all. One big shocker for me as an international immigrant into the US was how good the secondhand buying market is in the US. You can buy anything on Facebook Marketplace. It's almost the same quality at 50% or 20% of the original price. I got monitors that were worth $200 for $40 on Facebook Marketplace. Similarly, you can rent books or buy books like this. In any college, people will sell a lot of books. You can easily buy them um, of people who did a class. Or you can go to thriftbooks.com and buy used books. The second hand market in the US is so good because people move a lot between cities. People stay at a job for say one year and then they move out of the city and then they sell their pillows, their beds, mattresses, monitors, anything they can't carry on a plane because it's cheaper to just buy things anew in a different state. Like New York to California is a six hour flight. It's way more expensive to ship everything so they just sell everything. So the second hand market if you live in a city in the US is amazing and you should make use of that. I try to buy everything locally if I can. It's more sustainable, it's cheaper, it doesn't break a bank. I think that's a much better thing than buying it on, on an online site. All right, that's a wrap. That was financial management for students. I hope you learned something from this and this will help you save tons of money. If you found value from this video and want more content on education, you should hit the subscribe button. See you next week.